Welcome to Brody GP. This is episode number 96. We did not skip 95. The last episode was 95. I just failed at saying 95 in the beginning and people called me out for it. It's okay. You still listened. It was a great episode. Thanks for tuning into that one. On this time, this time around, we have Moto America at Road America because the Superbike races there were fucking amazing. We got World Superbike at Bruno. Race two was definitely worth watching. And then we're going to talk about penalties because there were some crashes going on. And after that, we'll probably introduce a brand new segment. All right, let's get this one going. <laughs> What's up, guys? As Rob said, we have uh, some Moto America to cover, some Superbike to cover, a brand new segment that's going to be an epic uh, car fire, dumpster fire, and couch fire all wrapped up into <laughs> one, and you will watch it. Uh, I'm Kevin. Or listen. That's Rob. That's Rob. Is that I'm Rob? I'm above you this time. I'm above that's you. Rob. I'm always above you. That's that's my that's my wet dream when Rob's above me. Uh, you're, you're a bottom bitch this time because Dennis yes, is missing. Yes, because Dennis is currently purchasing an MV Agusta F4 1000. That is a hell of good excuse for not recording on this show. <laughs> Straight up. If you're going to have an excuse for not recording on the show, yeah, buying an MV Agusta on impulse is definitely an approved excuse. Uh, he that has been said, looking for one for like – for probably two or three years he has told us multiple up. times he was going to do it this is he finally he finally uh, succumbed to the impulse and went ahead and did it yeah and it's low miles it was like one owner owned by a an older gentleman that is looking to uh what what did he pare down just downsized because he's moving and yeah. retiring or something yeah so dennis uh caught the deal of the century um we wouldn't want anything to happen to that bike but should anything happen to that bike he could call writer's law that's writer's law with a z.com <laughs> your california accident injury lawyers should uh he have anything uh from the smallest case to the biggest case and rob will tell you multiple times they work pro bono you do not if they if you don't get paid they don't get paid so call sigh if you have any issues uh uh, motorcycle uh, accidents, injuries, someone's at fault, you get rid of a stoplight, you have a problem, Rob is picking up a cat. I knew it. I knew he was picking up a cat. Yes. No, back to writer's law. Keep going. Back to writer's law. I will keep going. Anyways, uh, obviously, you, you listen to this podcast. You've heard us talk about them a million times. Rob talks about the racing they sponsor. It's all good. The fact that they sponsor us um, sort of regardless of content. All the various Kevins have been sponsored by <laughs> writer's law, uh, much to size chagrin at times. Um you know, but in this day and age, you know, uh, famously, we're recently blocked by a couple of journalistic outlets for only speaking the truth. You heard Real Kevin's rant on that last episode. The point being, Writer's Law has our has had our backs since day one, uh, regardless of the crazy shit we say or the truth that we spit or the weird uh, experiments we do on this. So I highly recommend that you – there's a cat butt on my screen right now. Um, so <laughs> – Anyways, all right, Kevin's uh, yeah, Kevin's and holding it together there. I can't hold it together. Rob put a cat on screen. What do you expect? Don't set me up to fail, Rob. <laughs> you can't be like Kevin. Do the writer's law. You know, real Kevin will do it. It's gonna be good. Then I'm like sitting there in the zone, right? Writer's law with a Z. Blah 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 blah. Go to their website. Check them out. They work. Uh, you know, pro. They, they don't. They you, if you don't get paid, they don't get paid. And Rob just comes up with a white fluffy cat, and he's just taunting me. And he's like, "Yep." Keep it together, Kev. It's like literally putting like crack in front of Tyrone Bigums' face and expecting him to continue with his real estate license. Super old Chappelle show reference that goes out to my homeboy Knack. I don't I, I didn't get that one, but I'm glad someone nope. will. Exactly. No, well, no I yeah. mean I'm sorry, Kev. I just uh that was actually that was Pearl. She planned it. I didn't I didn't know she was gonna come in. But uh yeah, we had to distract you. I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone on iTunes that's not watching the YouTube video. Um that's my little white cat. And uh, I found out from a Netflix show that Hello Kitty is white because white is the cutest cat color. That's all. Correct. Yeah. I can. Sorry, cur- we need we need uh, we need Dennis on here to have some like dog influence as opposed to just two guys that actually like cats. Two weirdos with their cats. <laughs> <laughs> We're both wearing dark colored shirts. I'm sure you can see all the white cat hair on my shirt now. Yes. If not, so, I need to turn up of, the the detail on my shirts. camera. You will see my very nice old school retro throwback uh, Brotendo shirt. That's Danny Pedrosa, by the way, not Mark Marquez. 
Uh, you can tell on. by the tiny body. You can tell by the teeny tiny little body. Um, the reason I bring up that shirt is if you were paying attention to our social media pages lately, you would have received a teaser for some very interesting news regarding the Bro GP merchandise that Ryan Gable claims we will never make. Fuck you, Ryan. You don't get a shirt. <laughs> Just kidding. You get a shirt. Actually, whoever um, gets a shirt is who's ready to... <clears throat> Go ahead. I will say whoever gets a shirt is purely based on if they're available when we drop them. Uh, first come, first serve. We have sold out of, like, I mean, the first Rossi shirt sold out in, like, two and a half hours. I don't think even I have one. Dennis doesn't have one. You don't. <clears throat> Nintendo shirt sold out in nearly every size in a couple days. Uh, so unless you want an extra large, otherwise they pretty much don't exist. And we do have merchandise, cool shirts. This is the first design, and uh, it's pretty interesting. And Rob may or may not have Laguna Seca special editions uh, at his booth at Laguna under the Brother GP and Writer's Law banner. Yeah, so speaking of Laguna Seca, Writer's Law is going to have a grip of racers there. we got five people racing under the Writer's Law banner. Me... Which, whom you all love my hair, Fabian Morales, the Writer's Law team manager, and then, of course, the, uh, the three originals, Michael Gilbert, Jackson Blackman, and Andrew Lee. And, uh, oh, Bada actually, boom. no, nope, screwing that up. Andrew Lee is actually not allowed to race at Laguna Seca because Stock 1000 isn't going there. So we're down to four. I screwed that one up. Um, but, yeah, but we'll be there. Um, by the time you watch this, Laguna Seca will be a week and a half out. So if you're in the area, definitely come by, say hi. Um, a lawyer, uh, Cy will definitely be there. Um, I, I'm not sure if Lawyer Rob is coming, but if he makes an appearance, we'll definitely uh, let everyone know. And uh, yeah, come by, say hi, come to the booth, get some, get some autograph posters, talk to the lawyers if you need any help. Um, but yeah, definitely check out Writer's Law and support the team, support Writer's Law, support us a little bit. Thank you for that. All right, um, we've talked enough about ourselves. Should we move into motorcycle racing? I could talk about myself for like the next hour if you want. I mean, <laughs> goddamn, that's that's my favorite subject. <laughs> I feel like you may uh, maybe we'll do a segment like that. See if anyone yeah, actually exactly. wants to watch it. You Speaking of anybody actually wants to watch it, and just a shout out to my man Anthony Bourdain. Pour one out for my homie. I'm not actually gonna pour this out because it would go right on the computer and stop this episode, but. Uh, <laughs> One of the coolest dudes around, um, you know, things didn't work out the way he wanted to, and he uh, he made a decision that's that's a tough one to make. So, uh, you know, his show was dope. Everything was great. He was actually big into jujitsu too. Loved his food, loved his travel. And the way I'm connecting this to speaking of us is that one of these days I'm going to start a show about travel and food and culture and art and bring it all together. And Rob is the motherfucking producer. That's going to be a show we are going to do. Uh, I'm going to, I swear to God, one of these is we're going to bring that out there and actually have a rad Viceland TV show. It may or may not have already been pitched to Mr. Sean Smith. And uh, if we get too big for y'all, fuck him. Who's, who's Sean <laughs> Smith? He's the guy that fucking owns Vice. Oh, oh okay. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, no, if you uh you need to put if you need me to put together a promo, Kev, let me know. We'll do that. Sweet. Right. Yeah. I feel like Move. we gotta make Broda GP a little bit bigger so that we can like get some capital. But that's why we're so All I'm shirts. saying is do you wanna have an episode that's not motorcycle related, but where Rob and I go to fucking Congo and eat human flesh? That's the real food. <laughs> that's the real shit. You're never gonna see that on you're gonna see that on TV. Did not expect that. I'm just saying, right. if it's mystery bush meat, you can't be positive it's not someone's arm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You're freaking me out a little bit here. Yes, yeah, so on the motorcycle mean, racing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. We just we just lost a lot of. Well, I don't what know. Do else? we have any vegan? Uh, any is is there a term that's like you're not a cannibal? A normal person? Yeah. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, on to Moto America at Road Atlanta. Boom. The two Superbike races, of course, they're up on YouTube. They showed up, uh, I think, by Monday or Tuesday, so they're you better have all watched them. I, I'm constantly sent messages about how to watch them. I post it on the Instagram and Facebook about how to watch them, and I still get the question, even though I spell it out. Here's how you watch it. YouTube, be in Sports USA. <laughs> They're on there for free. If you literally just type Moto America into the YouTube search engine, you will get the races. It's really, really not that hard. Like if you found us and you're listening to us right now, that's more work than it is to watch <laughs> these races. 
So you're saying they have the set of skills necessary to watch these races. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So be in uh, sports. You know what I'm gonna USA? do then? I'll go ahead. I'll put I think I could put be in sports playlist of all the races on our YouTube channel as well. Um so I'll do that. And then Moto America actually just released the the stock one thousand and the twins races the twins race from road America as well on their YouTube channel. So we'll try and link those as well. Cause we're trying to build the sport here. We know you want to watch the races. We want you to watch the races. So we'll make it easier for you. Go follow, right. go follow Kyle Wyman's page. That is very helpful too. And then tell Hannah that you should, you should get us on the broadcast team. Holy shit. I do have yeah, the application what? for a moto America credential for you. Media credential. Boom! Fuck Mona matters. We might need to like crowdsource <laughs> the the support to for them to actually say yes, but yes, I think that can be correct. done. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Race instead one. Of put, instead of putting our collective uh, skills together for evil, <laughs> i.e., sending uh, David Emmett fifteen thousand dick pics, put it. Let's put it together for the common good and get me a, a, a media pass for Moto America. I will straight dominate that paddock, and it will be awesome. Yes, you will. That will be freaking awesome. All right, we're moving on to race one. Should we should we actually talk about the race, or should we just jump to the final lap? That's I mean, it matters. was an amazing like, race. Like, like my grandpa used to say about basketball, give everyone 100 points and have them play the last two minutes. The fucking best thing that happened in racing in the last two weeks was the last two and a half minutes of Moto America 1. Yeah, because that track is so fucking long. It takes even the super bikes that long to get around right. there. Exactly. All right, so let's start with the final lap into turn one. I've got a video here of Tony Elise's pass on Cameron Bobier, and well, it didn't really it. start out. Yeah, it didn't really start out looking like a pass until the very end of the breaking zone. Freaking Tony Elise runs in there. He uh, he. Thankfully, they they both kind of pulled in in elbows and knees and didn't really come together that hard. Cameron was was pushed wide and managed to stay on the track, and uh, and Tony Elise made it through. Um, but this setup everything later on in the lap Correct. so i mean was this a fair pass do you think this was yeah just hell yeah he just passed him with some stank on it like you said they pulled their elbows and knees up no one crashed put a little fucking burn pass on him this is america dog these colors don't run okay tony elias can't come in here this isn't the fucking this isn't the fucking american spanish war this isn't the war 1812 dog this is america these colors don't run i'm saying he's coming in there he's on the yamaha with the blue and the red and the white fucking trim fighting our they got the spanish armada and conquistors coming up on us what do you think he's gonna do he's gonna throw shots across the bow son <laughs> wait wait who's throwing shots across the valley because this one tony passed yeah. cam that's what, no no i'm Sorry, I was like, so I was like two minutes and 20 seconds ahead. I'm just saying, yeah, it was a fair pass. <laughs> Tony didn't do nothing wrong. He's just racing hard because that's what they do. But you're going right, to, you already so that, know my opinion on the, the later pass. <laughs> yeah, right. Should I just, should I just jump straight to it? Where just do we have later, it? We got it right, right here. All right, here, here we go. The, uh, the later pass into, God, I can't ever, into Canada corner, the second to last, uh, passing zone, the right hander at Road America. And uh, Cameron Bobier comes, or I'm sorry, uh, Tony Elise is out front. Cameron Bobier pretty much barges through there while Tony was already on a, a tight line. It seemed like Tony Elias's bar or hand gets clipped, tucks the front tire, and down he goes. So Turnabout this, is fair play, son. I knew you were going to say that. Literally that exact phrase? I don't think I've ever said it till just now. Well, no, but we, never mind. I can't, I can't tell people that we talk about these things ahead of time. Right, plan all this you shit. You can't out. tell people they would prepare. <laughs> Even though it didn't, someone, someone on the last video called out Dennis's complete lack of preparation, and he told us repeatedly that he was not prepared. In Dennis's defense, when the guy tried to say he who was he texting, Dennis responded that he was texting his mom. So you know, <laughs> spitting fire. Oh, that was pretty solid. No, I mean, here's the um, thing: it was what was cool about this last lap was it was good hard racing where you generally didn't know who was going to win, what was going to happen. The, the lap kind of started with that, oh, shit. You know, Tony puts a hard pass. It's got some stank on it, no doubt. But I'm not complaining, and, and the guys even kind of all said they weren't complaining. Um, you know, Rubin, a little bit of Rubin's racing. Like I said, this is Superbike. It's fast and it's loose. It's not the same. It's it's a little different than MotoGP. You know, this is – it's it's Superbike. It's faster. It's looser. It's a little more wild. This is America. It's the Old West. You know, all those fucking common cliche tropes. But – 
like you said, they pulled their elbows in. There was no crash. Nothing happened. There was no problem. Um, but it set a precedent for, the first, that pass. This, for yeah. the first pass. But it set the precedent that this was going to be a dogfight of a, of a final lap. And what a dogfight it was. And, I mean, we haven't even talked about Josh Heron being involved in this whole melee yet and kind of having, a, a, you know, a perfect seat to see, to watch all this stuff go down. Later, Moto America would post, like, writer interviews with all of them. And Josh Heron would, uh, was the first one they actually interviewed. It was pretty good. That's also on that YouTube page, as I mentioned. Um, you know, and what you ended up seeing was some hard passing, some dog fighting, some outside passing Heron getting in the mix. And, you know, that, that dude just posted a picture of him where he removed the bike and put himself wheeling a Coors light. So, uh, you know what he's about, you know what I'm saying? And like I said, on our stories, if you don't like Josh Heron, I don't like you. So, um, straight up, but it was a hell of a race, but to, to top it off with the, 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 what we've been looking for with Moto America right now, which was an American racer, you know, homegrown kid, talent, you know, Cam on the factory Yamaha, finally bringing it to the Yoshimura Suzuki. And then you see Josh Heron, obviously crowd favorite, kind of an every man, you know, working man guy. He, hell, he has like a roofing trust company as like his side gig, which is sweet. The Heron compound uh, on, on the satellite bike that we would, I would generally thought he could win. I mean, I was thinking, shit, this is when he pulls it off. This is when Josh pulls it off. So I think it was everything Moto America needed uh, and it was followed up by again another classic race, and it was everything Moto America needed to really like get into the um, into uh, what am I trying to say here? Uh, like the zeitgeist of motorcycle racing again, right? Like back into the spot, like, like holy shit, here was an awesome race, which we had two factories, an American rider, a Spanish rider, a satellite rider, all this stuff. It was exactly what we were looking for, and you generally right. had no idea who was going to win. Privateer, not satellite. Privateer Excuse me. Private- rider. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, well, don't don't say that Superbike is faster and looser than GP. Don't go there. It's looser, but it's definitely not faster. I just meant fast <laughs> and loose. I didn't say there looser or not. But yeah, it's 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 a different style of riding, no doubt. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, this was this was the first round where we really saw Cameron Bobier be able to and and Josh Heron be able to challenge Tony Elias. Really, anyone challenge Tony Elias for for the entire race, right? And but and Tony Sands hasn't won all of the a ra- race. Yeah, and he hasn't he hasn't won all of the races, but this is where we it looked like Tony there was a chink in Tony's armor, and the two Yamaha the other two Yam or two of the Yamaha riders were able to take advantage of it, and uh, and both of them beat him in both races. So yeah, and, thing- and what really interests me about this one too, in, in watching this, you know, Cam would go on to do the double and kind of announce that he's he's there, he's looking for the win. They sort of put something together, but the thing that really is that the Heron and that attack R1 have really come up and quick. You know, they they got the the one podium in the rain, challenged, and then slow but surely. And like we were talking about before this, is that the fact that Josh Heron was able to to snag two podiums on a track that should be massively um you know a weakness for them with these long straights long lap times on a privateer bike you know like we were saying that last 10 that last five horsepower really make a huge difference we talk about how long and how fast this track is that the fact that they can really put that up where i'm getting at is this made me think back to the genius of him in round one on that fucking wiener schnitzel like r1s Tony Elias gets a DNF. Josh shows that he has the speed to fight for victory. Very well may may get those victories. You start to think like, oh wow, like he's he's not out of it. You know what I mean? And 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 it's just a story that really amazes me still. And it all kind of goes back to how he cowboyed up on that that R1S in that opening round. They're heading into Laguna. They, they you know they got Sonoma coming up. They got a lot of tracks that can favor a Yamaha, or at least that can that where a Yamaha that doesn't have quite the motor can still do pretty darn well. Yeah, you're talking about motor. I've got a clip here of uh, Josh Heron leading down the straightaway, and even without Tony Elias's amazing braking skills, it still seems that Josh Heron loses probably six to ten bike lengths down the straightaway. Right. So if he's not, if he doesn't get that amazing drive and he's not in the draft, he just loses just enough to those factory super bikes to, to actually have an impact on his race. And that would come to bite him in race two. And we're not even there yet. Actually, I'm sorry. It would come to bite him at the very end literally, of race I mean, one as literally well. Literally was the deciding factor. <clears throat> yeah. Where's the picture here? So, well, <clears throat> uh, before, before I get to the photo finish, 
Um, the one thing that I want to talk about that kind of overarches through this entire episode is is penalties. And we've seen a lot of rider rider contact lately with people going down and sometimes there are penalties, sometimes there aren't, right? It was a big, huge story with Mark Marquez, all starting kind of back in Argentina. Um, it's continued through there um, with Superbike. We're going to get to that soon, but there was obviously contact in that race. And then we get to this race. Like It, it seems like the penalties and everyone screaming for penalties, it, like that, that's happening in GP, it's not happening in Moto America. Is that because we haven't seen like a history of these riders do things like that or is it just america kind of resisting the urge to to throw the imagine the rule book the rules that don't actually exist at at these racers and okay, stop well, them well let me take these glasses off for a second because i'm about to get a rail up in here <laughs> do it i didn't actually know you were going to talk about this you have a good point so you you bring up something that in moto america we see this hard racing we see this uh you know rubbins racing like ryerford it was fast and loose that wasn't meant to detract it to, to to super to you know moto gp it was just kind of like the, the traditional american style uh, and super bike in general look at every other sport right now okay look at basketball the finals just finished up okay well uh and, and what you see basketball traditionally in american sport has become very global uh, very uh, have massive European influence. And what is the number one thing that sort of old school American fans get can't fucking stand is the flopping. And by flopping, mm. I mean uh, a guy uh, charges to the ball, charges to the basket, you put down, and when you hit a block, you fall and explode and fl flail like a fucking shitty, you know, uh, a soccer player, right? Yeah, when, uh, for, you know, exactly. When you say flopping, I think of football, I think of soccer. You think of soccer, but it's 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 a huge problem in basketball, in my opinion, because you know it's weird to watch in basketball when these guys are big, huge, massive guys. Look at LeBron. Look at some of these European players. You know, when you're six eight, two fifty, it's weird to flop, right? It's weird to to, to to sort of flail and look like a little weak guy that got knocked over, <laughs> right? No one in America, I would say no one in America, but the, the traditional sort of like idea of American sports is not to do that. You see, they don't want that. They don't want to see flopping. They don't want to see flying. So the idea that you're going to penalize someone and bitch and complain and, and demand some sort of official action against them is it, just counter, counter to like – the American view of motorcycling. We've talked about this before. Right? Like in, in Europe, motorcycling is transportation. It's totally normal. Lots of people mm. ride motorcycles. You go to France, right? Go to Paris and you'll see scooters inundating all around, you know, up the Champs-Élysées and all that stuff. And it, it's everyone from all walks of life riding those scooters. America, on the other hand, tends to have this cultivated image of the rebel, of the, the outlaw, of the, you know, I don't see any cops, fuck the police type of thing. So the last thing that the traditional American like fan, especially that's watching Moto America still right now, wants is to see a growth of penalizing people left and right and sort of watering down. The people that that don't want penalties are the same people that are asking me how come we don't cover Isle of Man because that's like the most baddest shit you can see, right? Like it's the same stuff in, in BSB. You don't see these penalties thrown around left and right because they still have sort of a tough guy image. And I think that's the difference that you're talking about is it's there's these two different outlooks on it. I'm not saying one is right or was one is wrong, but from the like traditional American point of view of like rugged individualism or, or whatever that um, that myth that gets sold, it, it, guys don't want to see that stuff. Yeah, it sucked it, uh, that that does, Elias went down. Yeah, that that does really seem like an American style. Like the when when you think of American two wheeled motorsports, I think more people would think of Supercross, and in Supercross. The All rule the still time. is turnabouts fair play, right. right? The thing that the thing that prevents contact and shoving people and uh, and literally crashing other people out from getting out of control is the fact that you know someone else can do it to you next time, and they probably will. I have I have something that I want to say. Like so, like we talk about different sports, right? Like football or basketball. I mentioned that basketball is kind of a traditional American, but it's very global, right? A lot it's played all over the world. But what is like yeah. the ones? There's football too, right? Football has a lot of penalties, and that might actually be the problem you see with declining ratings and all that. Is like it's too many penalties. But let's talk about like the original American pastime, baseball. Okay, the original like pastime. You know, like 
fucking Babe Ruth and America and fucking hot dogs and organ players and shit, right? I have, Baseball I have no ha idea where you're going here. <laughs> I, no, I got it. We're talking about turnabout's fair play, right? And that's part of the rules. Well, baseball has like that whole unwritten rule book thing, right? Like turnabout's fair play. If you if you fuck up or you do something weird in baseball, the next dude that comes up is getting fucking dotted, son, with a fastball right oh. off his dome, right? And that's normal. Yeah. No one's going to say shit. No one's going to do anything to that pitcher. Some guys might come out and they might get in their little pushing match, but there's not going to be a penalty. Baseball even has it down to like if you fucking if you get thrown out at first and as you're going back to the visitors dugout you walk across the mound the next guy's getting dotted for showing disrespect <laughs> right like if, if you yeah, if you yeah. if, if, if eighth inning and the dude's throwing a no hitter and you drop a bunt the fucking next dude is getting lit the fuck up and everyone knows it the announcers the fucking coaches the fans everyone knows it even though that's trying to win, right? Like you would yeah. want to put the butt down because it's no hitter. You're trying to get like something going here. But the turnabout fair play is what keeps penalties from happening and what sort of like keeps um, you know, the inmates from running the show completely. Just the insanity is that you know if you do something, you know, that's a little cheeky, as the Brits would say, it's fucking, you know, it's coming around the other side. It's coming for you. And that's what I mean by, like, um, sports and baseball is that if you do something a little too cheeky in baseball, that pitcher's lighting you the fuck up. You know what I mean? Or when that guy comes in from four, uh, from third base to home to score, he might just fucking drop a shoulder and blow the catcher out of the fucking field. You know what I'm saying? And that's part I mean, of the and game are... and accepting. Yeah, even, but even in baseball, there are still rules. Like, you can't, you can't deliberately deliberately like try and nail someone in the head like but you, you can, can if you're defending your motherfucking yeah. honor son. and that's what you cam can... was doing cam was defending the fucking honor of america cam was defending abraham lincoln him fucking self four score <laughs> and seven races ago cam bobier said no more no more. And he stood up to the Spanish Armada, and he shot across the bow. And if that shit sinks, should have made a better boat, motherfucker, because I'm firing cannonballs left and right, and I'm banging blonde chicks, and I'm eating hot dogs, and that's how we do at Road America. <laughs> That's perfect. That's why. See, that's why I said deliberately twice. Like you can't deliberately, deliberately do it. You can only deliberately do it. You just right. it's, you can't you can't pass that unwritten rule that far. Right. You get one chance at retaliation, and that makes it even. If you do it again, yeah. then you're going to get retaliated at. That's why they don't bean two dudes. You know what I mean? That's why they don't <laughs> knock out the catcher multiple times. You just turn it about, okay, now we're even. Now we're back. Let's get back in the game we play. Except, you know, in this case, fucking sucks for you, Elias. Pick the bike up, like Josh Heron said in his past interview, and don't fall over. Pick it up, run off, get back on track. Instead, you try to lean it over and stay with it, and you fucking crashed. Yeah, and he, I mean, he he was a little wide on that bump. We saw a couple of crashes, and that there's a dip kind of just offline in that corner, and it uh, it's not that friendly to the front tire. I think uh, Travis Wyman in the Stock 1000 uh, class tucked the front out of the lead, actually, and ended up not getting his, uh, not continuing his win streak in that class. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I totally agree with you. Like, turnabout's fair play. The thing that I, I do like the way that the American National Series Moto America is approaching this situation. I just worry that if it gets out of hand, we're going to end up with what GP has or even speak of the devil with what Formula One has, where shit right. has to be regulated. You mean putting the really dropping the checkered really flag two laps early on accident? That happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the yeah. biggest, most yeah, expensive that's... sport in the world, and some guy didn't know how to count right. Yeah, that's true. Hey, that happens to racers every now and again, even in motorcycling, right? They, uh, right. how many people have lost a win because they, they uh, didn't f finish the race? Kenny I mean, Roberts Jr. Down. lost a win on the fucking KR two eleven V because he thought it was over one lap early. That's dropping God knowledge on you, son. Two thousand six. Yep. You keep um, going until you see the checkered flag. That's one of the first rules they tell you, even in club racing. Just keep right. freaking going. I mean, here's the problem. <laughs> And I and I, I sort of uh, can see this point, like, you know, in baseball, you fucking you light someone up, you give him a black eye, you give him a bruise, he's got a fat Charlie horse, you hit him in the thigh, he's hurting for a couple of days, it's no big deal. And motorcycle racing shit can happen. I mean, we saw it happen this weekend in CEV, fourteen year old kid lost mm. his life, you know. Uh, yep. uh, so that's the difference 
but mm, we know what we signed up for. You know what's going on. It's like in it's in UFC, man. You throw a cheap shot and you poke me in the eye, you kick me in the nuts. I might fucking kick you in the nuts or punch you in the back of the head too. We are in a fight, and it's a dog fight. That's what those guys were in. And Elias put it out there that um that Elias set the precedent, which was with one lap to go, I'm down with contact. Yeah, and if you wouldn't have done it on the final lap, maybe Cam would have forgotten a little bit about it, right? If he had done right. it uh, halfway through the race on lap six or something. Uh, but yeah, but to remind Cam, I'm down for contact. I'm coming through freaking 12 corners before. You know that Cam is going to do exactly the same thing. And I mean, Cam's pass was a little bit later than Tony's into turn one because it was in turn one, it was more of them coming together. And in when Tony went down, it was more of uh cam coming up behind him uh but at the same time like i gotta go with racing incident for both both incidents and uh and i'm not gonna fall either of them like i'm not calling for penalties on cameron bobier and i kind of hope that we don't get there yeah yeah but all right i don't think we will and (laughs) hold on i'll finish your point real quick not one i think we won't get there but there's not enough money in fucking moto america right now for it to matter like you know like (laughs) don't don't deb us come on um, no, I mean, it's true, right? Like, you look at the budgets of Mo- uh, of Repsol and all that stuff, and you see this and that, and people start to complain. Man, they're spending a hell of a lot of money, millions and millions and millions of dollars to fly international branding teams around a race. So there's a lot more sway. <clears throat> Excuse me. Emotions are running a little higher. Things are more – people are a little more high-strung on that stuff. And in Moto America right now, it's just not quite at that massive level where, where people are trying to pull those strings. And I like that. I mean, I want the sport to grow and I want things to get bigger, but there's a diminishing returns. With, I want it to get bigger without anyone trying to pull those strings. Right. Yeah. We don't, we don't need those strings. And there, there are plenty of rumors about it already happening, especially with the, uh, the smaller classes and whatnot. Um, but, and, and I mean, we know, obviously, there are really only two factory teams in Moto America. They, there are strings, but right. they're not like, and, and, uh, and Yoshimura Suzuki did release a statement about the pass and about the incident, but it wasn't it, it wasn't calling for penalties. It wasn't um yeah, it uh it wasn't like it wasn't like something that we might see from HRC or from Yamaha in MotoGP. But all right, no, we gotta round out the race one. Um so here is the finish. Uh well here here's both of them crossing the line of picture. Uh Josh Heron is coming out of the final corner. And it looked like he got a pretty damn good drive, but Cameron Bobier, yeah, Cameron Bobier had that uh, that factory motor pulled by the Attack R1 motor and uh, beat him by what does it look like half a tire's width? Yeah, it was point oh oh two or something. Point oh two, yeah, point oh oh two. Not not the closest race that we've seen in Moto America finish because I think there was one at uh, there was one last year that was a little bit closer, but. But I mean, dude, like how I've been I've been robbed before like this and it sucks so bad when you just cross the line and you're you're a foot short of getting that position. And for yeah. Josh Heron, for getting that win, for getting a privateer win. Yep. Snatched from the jaws of victory, you know. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I was really rooting for Josh. Obviously, we're big fans of the dude. Uh, you know, Cam winning is good, too. The, the the factory team winning is good, too. I, I was trying to think to myself the other day, like, what would have been better for the sport if it proved that a privateer team could win with just some good influence or if it proved that with, you know, a, a, a top-tier American rider you can win. Like, I'm trying to figure out which, which one would have given us more investment in the series, you know, and uh, – yeah, so, I mean, uh, well, Josh Heron hasn't. Uh, I th- I'm going to go with Josh Heron there, right? We've seen Cameron Bobier win before. We know that Graves Yamaha has it. Uh, I can't remember the last time Attack Performance won in a national race. Back when they were running Kawasaki's and shit, you know? Yeah, probably probably days ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, yes, and Josh is obviously. Yes, this water is hotter fuck in my house right now. <laughs> Josh Heron obviously is the the social media genius that is bringing a lot of support to this sport, and I want to see him on the top step of the box. I think everyone yes. else that is watching this sport wants to see him there too, especially after such a barn burner of a race. But right. we didn't get it. We got Cameron Bobier, and the uh, with Tony Elias going down, the title is now considerably closer. And they, I think they were what, uh, like ten points or something, separated after the first race, and then after the second one, which we are now going to get to. 
And I just want to bring up something when it comes to Moto America. You know, like uh, sometimes people will see like, uh, you know, Moto GP and Mark Marquez wants a bunch of races and you think it's going to be over. Uh, World Super with Johnny Ray. American racing is sort of famous for this, like it's not over till it's over situation. You know, AMA had, excuse me, AMA had some funny point situation, but I just want to throw like a throw by a couple things. In 1998, Ben Bostrom won the ra- the title without winning a race. Oh, damn. I believe it was 2007 when Matt Milladen won, broke the record for most wins in a season and still didn't win the title. He lost to Ben Spees by a single point. So we got to remember as we're watching Moto America that early on someone like Tony Elias winning a lot of races does not in any stretch of the term like mean that – and you look at Josh Heron. He won the the American Superbike you know, championship with less races than other you know, less race wins that Tony won a lot of races early on should not turn you off from wanting to watch these races or watch the series because it, it has a history of come from behind victories, a history from underdog victories, a history for people that you assumed would win the title going to not win the title. So yeah, I mean, and yeah. the rest of the calendar too in Moto America is very, very. They're all very different tracks, right? A lot of shit is going to happen. Um, I mean, it's a Moto America is almost like an international series because of how far they have to travel and how different all the tracks are. It's not like the UK where they're driving fucking six hours across the country, right? We're going to right. Like I want. Here. I wonder if you were to look at actual miles traveled by teams, if in Moto America they travel farther than in European Superstock. You know what I mean? I I wouldn't be surprised, actually. (laughs) No, someone. uh, I was talking. I was talking to the the tuned racing owner um, at Laguna a couple weeks ago, and and he told me the mileage number. Shit, I don't remember what it was. It's it's ridiculous how far they have to go because it's two entire loops around the country. If you're based in California, if you're based in California, you start out over here, you go all the way over to to Alabama and Virginia, and then you head up to Wisconsin, then you come back over to Utah and you do California again, and then you go all the way back to New Jersey and finish in Alabama. So it's it's two laps. It's massive. And because these tracks are so different, I think they're going to, like you're going to see Tony get to other tracks where he's not going to perform the same way he does at Coda, which is a track that he seems to go amazing at every single year. So just, yeah, keep watching for sure. But speaking of keep watching, race number two, we start this one out with uh, with some bad news for our previous uh, number one pick for things to watch in uh, in Moto America, and it's Matthew Skultz chucking it down. Uh. The road. I know, right? Where is it? I'm only showing you the video because he is he is absolutely okay. He uh, it was a very weird place to crash. It it coming over the rise and just I don't. We actually I don't even know what happened because there isn't very good footage of it. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And there's also not very good pictures of it. I want to fucking harp on Moto America for a minute. Dog, we are trying to do our best, but your media outlets, like Grave Sport doesn't post shit. How do you have a factory (laughs) team that doesn't post shit? KTM has more pictures on their fucking KTM factory page of handlebars and rear sets than you have of your entire race weekend. Get on that, son. It's not that hard to hire some people to fucking have a photographer out there. Get out there on some corner, take some pictures. What the hell is going on? Speaking speaking of all these photos that are up on the YouTube, these are all brought to you by the uh, the teams themselves and therefore free use. So uh, yes. thanks to them. Thanks and to we're them. We're showing you we the highlights. Have... Yes. <laughs> anyway, my point being is the reason we don't have a fucking picture or images or good video of this is because you know the, it is lacking on the the back end media. You know the post production media of race weekend is over and then trickling out pictures and helping sponsors and posting cool stuff and. I mean, I think when I when I post pictures for Moto America on our website, I have two sources at this point that are reliable, which is Yoshimura's page and Josh Heron's personal page. Awesome. I know yeah, that okay. I know that premier entrants in Moto America get like a huge grip of footage and photos at the end of the weekend. Um, you gotta so, post like, it. Even, I'm a media manager out there. How can Graves yeah, I mean, not? Even, even Writer's Law is getting footage of you know all the footage of Michael Gilbert and Jackson Blackman and stuff. Um, but it just might be it might be coming out too slow, or obviously, yeah, they need someone up on social media that's posting all of this stuff. I will. <laughs> we'll talk to we'll talk to the Writer's Law team manager to see if we can uh, get you some of that, Kev. 
So see if it happens. But all right, mm-hmm. on to the rest of the race. So uh, the race was red flagged after Matthew Skoltz's crash. Uh, they restarted it. It was shortened to eight laps, which is amazing because I love it when uh, when races are shortened and they become sprints. I mean, even Road America. Is, love race yeah. sprints. Yeah, it's Road America is a massive track, so eight laps is actually still quite long. I think a club race around there is is four laps, so it's still double that. But that's like, I mean, I think the the Junior Cup race was was or the the stock 1000 race or the twins race was eight laps so it's great to see the superbike racers they don't got to worry about tire wear they don't got to worry about fuel consumption they just go balls to the wall not like they not that they weren't in race one but they did it again in race two (laughs) yeah and even josh heron was even more balls to the wall and some of those exits holy shit some of those videos of him where he is so loose it's insane yeah, I mean, even and that's the thing, right? Josh Heron was struggling early in the season with with rear tire wear and being able to last race distance for so for him to get a shorter race and for him to have the confidence of race one being able to battle to the end, you knew that he was fighting the red mist uh, this entire race. What video uh, are we showing here? Hold on a here's, second. Here's we had yeah. multiple people ask us last episode what red <laughs> mist was. Really? I don't know how you're listening to this podcast not knowing that, but let me just read it real quick. Red mist is when someone does some shit and the red mist of fucking anger blood comes over your fucking eyes, dog. They light up like the fucking demon from Ghostbusters, like the dude from Legend that's hanging out with long-haired Tom Cruise and your horns grow and it's just fucking evil time, son. It's time to do some damage. It's time to say, fuck it. I don't give a shit. I'm putting it down. That's the red mist. If if Dennis the red was here, mist he'd is make like a give Hulk no reference of the uh, of the green eyes popping out. Right when it's like yeah. you don't want to see me angry. I mean that's what yeah. red mist is when you see me. But angry. it's red, and it happens to people that don't have superpowers unless they're on a motorcycle. Correct. And then they have superpowers, and the red mist happens. So yes, right. if you didn't get, I think someone posted either in the army or on our social media page. If you didn't get the reference of Marquez working with Showy for like anti mist or mist repellent that's the joke is he's right. repelling the red mist because the red mist is what makes him angry and that was one point in our last podcast talking about marquez crashing did the rest the red mist come out and cause him to crash now you know don't forget it right okay so, no anyways. wait we were talking about yeah we were talking about racing here um shit where were we at what? Help me Where out we, here, at, son? we right here. You live in the Riders <laughs> Lost Studios, son. Recording Brodo GP <clears throat> in, in fucking beautiful Wales vagina. San Diego. San Diego. <clears throat> um, I got it's some fact videos that here. It's the I got some in the world. It's, a fact. It's, it's amazing, Kev. I don't know why you don't live here. If I lived in San Diego, the amount of content that Rob and I would put out per week would be fucking ridiculous. It, it might not be like curated or like high quality. It would just nope. be content. <laughs> Excellent use of the word curated. I love it. You're gonna bring uh, an artist. Right. Kev. You're gonna bring an artist, Kev, with talk like that. Yeah, right. Where you were the one that keeps bringing up like museum trips and posting like real art to your personal social media. No, all right. I'm gonna show a video here. My personal social media, real quick. Shout out to my fans, my uh, to our my friends, not fans, but my friends, because that's what we are. We're just friends. We're a community. I'm a regular guy. Y'all like, I got a lot of friend requests right now, and it's not that I'm not accepting them. I am, but like. You know, we don't talk about certain subjects on this fucking podcast because we don't want to alienate people. But you might. I got some shit that I say on my own personal Facebook that's a little. <laughs> yeah, like you, just, you might decide you might you don't like me anymore. You're so you're telling people to shy away from your personal stuff. No, I'm just saying. You know, don't ask questions you don't want answers to. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I agree on that one. Yeah, don't do it. Kevin can get really <laughs> riled up. He's he's cultured. He's traveled. He knows his shit. I do know Which my stuff, and we're going to make a TV show about it. Yeah, exactly. I, why am I blowing you up? I don't need to do this. No, yes, we're getting off topic here. This is terrible. That's all right, I'm mean. going to play this. How's that off topic? All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Tony Elias' challenge for the win in race two pretty much came to the to an end in the same exact corner. My fuck missed, dog. Yeah, he missed a bunch of downshifts and, uh, and ran wide, and that was kind of it. Put him back into fourth place. Boom. Put him back into fourth place. Put my man Gurloff in third. 
and uh tony got mind fucked i mean here's the thing like he, that, that goes back to the red mist he's going back to the scene of the crime you know what i'm saying like he's doing well he's leading there it is that's where it all went wrong you can't is do that, that why you're is that why you're saying mind fuck just because it was the same exact corner it's the scene of the crime son that's where it happened it's the same exact it's just that's what's going on I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, like we, we talk about with Marquez, right? That he crashes, he, he tucks the front like two or three times every single race, and eventually it's gonna bite him. It seemed like Tony Elias's tight and aggressive corner entry is exactly like that. He's not tucking the front unless he gets taken out. Um, but he, he missed the downshifts. The bike was sideways. He missed the downshifts. He wasn't able to get it stopped. He was taking too many risks because his setup wasn't there. I don't think he got mind fucked. I just couldn't pay attention that... because that was what happened, bro. You can, it's like trying to fucking like you and your fucking girlfriend, like forever young is your song. I want to be forever young. <laughs> right. And then like you guys broke up and it was a bad breakup. And then you're driving, you're heading to a, you're fucking heading to a stop sign and forever young comes on the radio. And you're like, what the fuck? And you, boom, you blow the stop sign, right? Right past the red light. It's it, you're mind fucked by Forever Young, song. I mean, Tony Liz, have you seen him? He is not Forever Young, and you cannot, you know, if that song comes on the radio and that's playing, it's brutal. That's the scene of the crime, the breakup. That's when they fucking put the dagger in the heart. That's when him and Cam, they don't even talk it anymore. Josh Heron was saying they're arguing and yelling, and Tony's saying some people said some shit. And I'm not like that, and I don't ride like that. And why you got to say I do that when you do that? You know what I mean? Like, the fucking girlfriend's mad at him because he's got weird texts on his phone, but she's got weird texts on her phone, too. And you can't be bringing that up to me if you got weird texts, too. It's just going down the whole time. Forever Young's playing in the background. I want to be for you. Like, it's fucked. Like, it's, <laughs> it's fucked all around. And you can't ever hear that song the same way again. Kev, I will never get tired. The same way again. I will never get tired of your relationship analogies. They work. Like, Dude, there's so I I hope that all of our female listeners are like they're able to relate to this because it's you always tell them from the dude perspective or maybe not always but most of the time I hope the female listeners can relate to this as well. I I feel like they're they're they should they have better emotional sense than the motorcycle racing male population. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Jen has better emotional sense. That chick is wild. You're calling her out. You're calling <laughs> Jen out. One of the OGs. Oh man. Um, all right. No, I mean, all yeah, I'm so, saying so, is that at fundamental level, our whole existence, Rob, is just relations. We're, 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 uh, humanity is a group and a core, and everything is relations and relations with people back and forth. Like, for example, me and you and my secret homosexual obsession with you, that is the lens that we'll through get there how GP is recorded. I just use, I use the relationships as, as a, an analogy to make these, th these worldly ideas uh, uh, palpable to everyone. So when you're talking about my bird arms, it's really just a secret compliment is what you're telling it is. me. It's not a secret about it. Look at those fucking arms. Boom. Flex, Rob. Flex right now. Hit a buy. Right hand buy. Do it. <laughs> not going to do He's it. not doing it. Not going to do, do it. it. No, I'm going to I'm gonna play another it? video and we're going to move on. What do I got here? Uh, a pass with three laps to go. Uh, Josh Heron getting in really deep into the same exact corner. Everything happens in Canada corner. Uh, and Cam right. coming through. This, it's amazing to see. I'm going to keep showing you these Have things. Have you heard that song, you... Forever Young? Don't think Tony Elias is the only guy whose that was his <laughs> song with his girl. That was a song for, like, millions of people. And including oh, man. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> All right, getting to the final lap here. Uh, what is this? Another, another run into Canada Corner. Josh Heron goes a little bit wide. This is the final lap. Cameron Bobier comes on through. And you're thinking, all right, maybe Josh has a chance in the final corner for a nice block pass and he can slow down the superbike motor. And then we get to the final corner. Josh goes super deep. And, or sorry, not super deep, super tight. Spins it up on the curb. Huckabucks almost loses it. And Cam comes through for his second win of the weekend. Do you like my play-by-play? Not play -play super play? deep, but super tight. Tight. Title of Rob. I'm not Wait, saying he can reach the bottom to it again, but he can blow the sides out. <laughs> you actually cut out there a little bit for your for the hashtag title Rob Sex Tape, but I think uh, everyone got it, and I didn't need to remind them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. 
I don't know what else to say. It was a great number, uh, a great race Super for the deep. second Superbike race. Yeah, I mean, it, what's that? <laughs> you cut out a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a great number two race. Uh, it really rounded out the weekend. It was, again, sad to see Josh Heron not get the win. Um, and, but still, it just makes me want to watch Moto America more. Right. Definitely was, you know, a lot of good racing, um, you know, class. I said, "Lap." Moto America might have problems with with the, the depth of the field right now, but it kind of brought me back to some of the classic laps in MotoGP in like the 800 CC era. The, the depth of the field wasn't there, but there was definitely some races that really made you want to watch. And hopefully, we can build off of that stuff for sure. I mean, what what Josh is proving is that a moderately funded team with a motivated rider can podium and do well and fight for wins in Moto America. What I wouldn't love well, to see to be to be fair, it's factor. also. To be fair, it's also a a, a previous Superbike Championship rider, right? We're not we're not we're talking about one of the best riders on the grid, e, e, it, and we can include many other Superbike grids and still put him right. in that so book, right? All you need, I mean, Tony yeah. Lewis the same way, right? Tony Lewis was all I'm saying is you need a top a a good a good solid top tier rider with a moderately funded team gets you repeatedly on the podium. All right, last point, real fast for race number two. Big shout out to Roger Hayden for getting back on the box. He's been having a, a tough start to the season, and it's good to see him perform at the level we know of, right? He's a previous race winner. The team has been doing obviously amazing with Tony Elias. Kind of expect him to be a little further up, um, but for him to put it in third place for race two was solid. I love Roger Hayden. He's a great guy. He's had a hell of a career. You can't fault anything for him. He's been entertaining as hell all, all, all uh, his whole career. Kind of almost like the character of the Hayden family, which is funny to say because they're such a lovable, uh, entertaining family, right? Mohawk guy riding for Premac uh, wild cards and, and doing some crazy stuff. You know, Nikki famously once said he didn't think GP was ready for him. So I'm not throwing shade at Roger when I talk about that I think maybe – at this point, we're just congratulating him on barely sneaking a podium. Maybe it's time to think about calling it a day, you know, finish the year, finish the year out, try to get a win or two, get some podiums and, and, and you know, leave with your head held high. Everyone has that point in their career. It's like Danny Pedrosa, you know, is, is potentially retiring. Seems to be that announcement is imminent and it's probably a good time for him to do that. All I'm saying is that right now when me and Rob talk about Mona America, and I made this point about Ben Spees, we talked about dude, could Ben Spees take Josh, Her Josh Hayes' place, and you know, Rob was adamant that he didn't want that. He wanted us to grow new talent or to bring other talent in. You know, Mona America right now is sort of in a renaissance point of view where it can be a melting pot for American writers coming up young international riders looking to make a name for themselves outside of the traditional venues, a la Skolzi from South Africa, or international riders looking to rebrand, remake a name, and re-rise up like Tony Elias. Um, for me right now, I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to say it, and I'm going to put this out into the universe via the secret style. I wish nothing but the best for Roger Hayden. I hope he gets a couple wins, rides off for the sunset, and next year, Scott motherfucking Redding, the Chavy, a chaviest dude out there himself, comes and rides in America. Fuck BSB, fuck World Superbike, and the World Superbike Super a second. I want Redding in America. Redding posted yesterday a shirtless pick with a backwards hat dominating a Burger King burger. He's already American. <laughs> fuck. I'm just saying. Dude might lose even... his ride in GP. I want to see this be the place where guys can come international. He's still young. He's not some old dude. He's still young as fuck. He just had some bad spots in his career. Bring him over Yoshimura. Slang him some money. Let him come with his fucking purple dyed hair and his motocross winning girlfriend and their fucking goat. You're telling me you can't put Scott <laughs> Redden in an Airstream and 57 Whoppers and a goat and and he will go door to door and sell that series to <laughs> everyone in the Midwest, and we will love him for it. Oh man, I wonder. I wonder if he'd have fans in the Midwest. I don't. I do. Do you think Monkey Fresh sells really good in America? <laughs> yeah, he's, bro, dude owns a goat. His girlfriend rides motocross, and he fucking throws mad shade at his employer on his Instagram, and he spends all day on his stories. He, he, they like him yeah, in the Midwest. He's, you're right. He's going to be popular. He's American that's as fuck. Fucking, <laughs> that's awesome. All right. We have to. We really have to move on to World Superbike now. Okay. Um, 
let's let me let me bring this picture up right here. So we're not going to talk about race one. I'll, I mean, a, a fucking Johnny Ray won it. He now has the record for most wins. It Who was cares? boring. He pulled away. It was terrible. Uh, the Ducatis weren't able to challenge him. They've had setups problems. I'm already talking way too much about race one. But in race number two, oh, oh, shit went down. Shit went down. This shit happens. So, so we, uh, I, I tempted you earlier. I, I, uh, I told you I was going to bring it up. Teammate contact where someone crashes is what happened in race number two. So just like Boom. Shades of Ducati a little while ago, same thing happened to, uh, to Kawasaki in World Superbike, and Johnny Ray goes down. So Johnny Ray, of course, came out after the race, blamed fucking Sykes. Uh, race direction didn't penalize Sykes in any way and said they weren't going to take no further action. We will get to that a little bit later. The championship is in no way. Right. He's like 80 points danger. up. Yeah. Or but he, it, was he it, did pull his now? best Casey Stoner impression and stood up and was clapping uh, for Sykes in amazing <laughs> Casey Stoner 2011 Le Mans race-esque, uh, which yep. was pretty salty, but in like the most loserist of ways. You know what I mean? Like no one thought he was cool for doing that. No one even likes him as the villain. Is he a villain? But, Can he be? No, he's not. The, he can't be the villain. He's incapable. Right. He's just like one of those shitty villain from the middle Marvel movies that like no one cares about. Like who even was the villain in Thor the Dark World, right? I don't even know. Who knows? Did that movie even happen? Did Johnny Ray's career even happen? Do any of us actually care? Or was this just this <laughs> negative space in World Sewer Bike where like it was just green screen and no one knew exactly what was going on? And then slowly hints of red and blue started coming in and then we all started watching again. It was some pasty elf guy. Yeah. And that's all I remember. Right. Sounds like Johnny Ray. <laughs> Some little pasty elf guy. And if you don't like me saying that, fight me. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I mean, so the so the move was uh, Johnny Ray tried to pass into one of the lefts. He went a little deep uh, and then had to run wide on the right, the subsequent right, because that's pretty much half of the Bruno track is, is left, right, right, left. And uh, Tom Sykes essentially tried the cutback, came up the inside, and two, the two riders came together. So they, they were going for the, the same piece of track, and Johnny Ray kind of just got barged out of the way. So the, the thing that I really want to talk about here, and, and this goes back to my penalty thing, is, is like if we, it was announced that the penalty, that, that Tom Sykes was not going to receive, receive a penalty after he had already crashed out does that does that make you wonder kev does that does that make you think like oh maybe race direction is is playing a little something here like because we've seen this in in previous incidents like if if the person that causes the crash or causes the incident if they also crash out they're less likely to be penalized or they're going right, to receive because a smaller they were, penalty. They received a, a de facto penalty. I mean, that's what happened with Sykes. He basically received a de facto penalty by not being able to finish the race. So he took no advantage from the move and the move effectively caused him, you know, his own penalty. If you take advantage, but it, of the but move, it didn't, it was a different move, right? He crashed in a completely separate incident, right? But turnabout's fair play. We just said later. Shit. Right, but we just said this. Like he, he ended up causing his. You know, he, um, you know, he, he, he wrongfully blasted some dude in the face, and in the process broke his fucking hand. That's the, you know, I don't know. That's, the, that's. But the, so here's the thing. Here's the thing, though, right? If if it's like if, I mean, if you this, can't it, steal, it, if you steal some chick that your that your friend was after, and it turns out she gave you the fucking clap, your friend ain't mad. <laughs> is that the same thing is that the same thing but it's not no it's not the same thing because <coughs> oh, don't sykes ask crashing me. out tom sykes crashing out wasn't him uh getting the clap from the same chick it was dating a completely different chick no and no, getting no, the no, clap no, 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 no. yes you it don't was get because... it right away bro he that, that shit comes on like a week <laughs> and a half later it doesn't happen right away <laughs> he still got his nut Are you it was all good there? He you still got, got his there. nut, and then, like, fucking a couple laps later, he's like, God damn, I got to piss, and it burns like a <laughs> motherfucker. Why do my balls itch so much? 
Oh man. All right. All right. Your, your analogy works slightly better, but I'm still not buying it. I mean, if they are two separate incidents, like if Marquez had done this, everyone would be calling for him to get a penalty right away for the first incident for, for barging someone off track. And then, and then he'd re hopefully receive it and then he'd crash out. Right? Like race directions, ability to prevent people running other people off track is reduced if they just don't hand out the penalties when they should be. If they just wait for kind of the final result to see like, oh, maybe it'll work out. If your piece starts to burn, don't wait to see if maybe it'll work out. Go to the doctor. <laughs> Exactly. So, <laughs> so if everyone is, if, if there are people that are calling for uh, race direction to apply penalties to Sam Sykes, they needed to have done it right away. They had to get that shit done. I'm not saying that he deserved a penalty. It's just, if it needed to happen, the fact that him crashing out absolved him of any penalty, sh it shouldn't be the case, right? He still should have received a like back of the grade. If anything, all it does is change the penalty that Tom Sykes should have received. Right, because maybe maybe in this race, if he stays upright, he just because you're penalty. a chick who hooks up with a dude and doesn't use any protection, and you're think you're fucking scrambling for the morning after pill the next day, but then you get your period a couple of days early. That doesn't absolve you from the fact that you shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. <laughs> there we you know go. What I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> Kev, you shouldn't be agreeing with me though. People like it when you don't. Okay. Well, I, what is your deal with fucking penalties? Your obsession with not wanting penalties. You're Mr. Rulebook guy. You're Mr. By the Book. I mean, you you are. That's the a, thing. I I will get there. But I mean, these these penalties they're not in the rule book. They fall under the rule that this, when something is unsafe, race direction can do whatever the fuck they want. This goes back to the same thing about the Marquez point scheme. Like, I don't think that what Tony Elias and I don't think what happened between Bobby and Elias was anything more than, you know, an unfortunate racing incident. And I don't think any what happened with Sykes and Ray is that because neither of these guys have a serious history of riding dangerous. Neither of these guys have a trend where they continue to skirt the rules. I mean, you could say that, look, Tony made a hard but fair pass. And Cam got a little hot-headed and tried to make a similar hard but fair pass. And things went south. You could say that Tom Sykes does not have a, a history of riding um, too hard. But you could say that he you know, he made a mistake and something went down. If, if Tom Sykes was doing this again three, four, five, six times, you worry about it. If he does it again the next race, you worry about it. But, you know, Cam does, you know, that hard move and you don't see him do anything too, too hard. And he has a good hard racing. that's fair and clean with hair in the next race. And then you, I don't think that you're going to see like Sykes act in a fool, uh, coming up, you know, in the next round of world Superbike. For me, the reason the penalties aren't handed out is because mistakes are mistakes and it's not a trend until you have, you know, like you can't have an average until you have one, two and three. Right. But so there's no, there's no way to average it this season yet. Well, so that's so so th that's why we have penalties, and I totally agree with you there. Right? Is is they want to buck trends of unsafe riding and of people getting run off track and and all that stuff that we don't want to see. Right? We don't want a championship decided by someone taking someone else out. Right? We want we want them unless to race you're hard, Loris Caparossi. Say that again. Unless you're Loris Caparossi. <laughs> what year was that? That's like '98 or something. I'm not. That's so long ago, bro. That was so, so long, long ago. ago. I, yeah. I didn't I didn't watch pro and motorcycle racing back then. I'm gonna have to, to rem, you'll have to uh, find me the exact race and I'll go check yeah, that one. Let out. me get you. Let me let me tell you the real reason that Sykes received no penalty, because no one wants to see Johnny Ray win again. No one cares. <laughs> no one wants more to see more Dorna conspiracies. Are you can no, you know how happy they were to see fucking out? I mean, the first first of all, the British media had one giant collective fucking orgasm at the same time when he won that race, and he's basically the second coming to fucking G Brit Jesus. You know, like when Alex Lowe's won that race, the amount of of coverage they got and just Twitter trends and engagement alone was worth you know Johnny Ray's little temper tantrum. Um, I mean, you just said we don't watch we don't watch just for the racing. We watch for the racing and for the sport and the storylines and the writers and the people, to see the, and the people 
And in, in super bike racing, you also root for factories. You tend to root for the bike that you like. You tend to root for the bike that you may potentially own or want to own. And to see the R1 win another race this year, the third race, and they fight, Yacht Team Yamaha Pata has finally seemed to have broken through uh, that glass <laughs> ceiling. And for me, it was great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I generally like rooting for the underdog. Um, it was great to see one of the Lowe's brothers finally get a win. It's probably been like two years since either of them have won. Well, I really don't need to talk about both of them. Um, one of them is not in this series. And, right. uh, and but yeah, and Yamaha is coming on strong. Uh, they finally got a package together. And they Yamaha, they put in the effort, right? They put in the investment and the effort into World Superbike. Uh, they made sure to sign two pretty good riders. And they've, they're now seeing the fruits of all that labor. So it, it's great for them to come on. And uh, yeah, if like it was kind of funny though, two things happened that made it quite a bit easier for Lowe's to win this race. Correct. Johnny Ray didn't like make it into the top three off the first lap because in the second race, right, we have the grid reshuffle, mm -hmm. and uh, normally he's already up there by by the second or third corner, and that didn't right. happen in this race, which is very weird. He said in post race interviews that he was kind of just biding his time and waiting to to just see how it played out because he wasn't really wor he he probably wasn't worried about the people that were out front because he's fucking Johnny Ray snooze fest and then the other thing that happened was Marco Melandri took himself out of the race right yeah so i've got that here uh marco melandri where's that, where that video where's that video there is that marco melandri passes lows uh and then just proceeds to botch the braking into one of the left handers oops like i'm yeah, I was really glad he didn't Mama crash, me. but fuck. So close. So close. <laughs> so Biggie close man. to that air fence, too. Exactly. Um, yeah, and uh, and so with, with the two main challengers for this race, Lowe's is able to hold off his teammate and put together just a solid performance and win the freaking race. It was great to but see. Still beat Chaz, though. I mean, it's not like he didn't beat Ducati's number one rider still. Yes, Marco Melandri had a problem, but you could argue that Chaz is still the number one rider, at least it was last year. Um, mm. You know, there have been some problems this year, but what Yamaha has done, Yamaha, what Yamaha has done <laughs> is put themselves in a position where they are now battling they are neck and neck and equal with the Ducati team and just one step behind the Kawasaki team you know things go right Lowe's can win the right circumstance and and Vandermark can do the double they're there I mean both riders have won now and and there's been some circumstances but it's not like this was a weird wet race you know where we saw a bunch of weird shit on the podium. He didn't win this race under a bunch of crazy circumstances. There was no Johnny Ray, and Marco Melandri fucked up. I mean, Marco Melandri's not exactly known as a guy who doesn't fuck up. Now, this, is the, this is the reason why he's ridden for, like, every manufacturer at some point, because he bounces around. Yeah. You know, Lowe's was able to, uh, you know, you can't be lucky unless you put yourself in a, in a position to take advantage of that luck. You know, I mean, because Marco Melandri runs off and, and nearly crashes. And did that matter to Chaz Davis? No. No, I, yeah, I totally agree. But it to, mattered to for Lowe's. First, right. To finish first, first you must finish. Correct. Yeah, works every time. Yeah, and Lowe's, I mean, Lowe's wasn't even really that lucky. Just like you just said, it was only two things that kind of swung his way. And you, you could probably argue that in every single race, there are always two things that swings the way of the winner. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think you could argue in every race that there's, you know, in, in most high level sports, like you see this in American football, right? Like the one stat that shows you who wins is turnovers, i.e. mistakes, mm. Yep. In high level sports in general, it really comes down to who makes more mistakes or who capitalizes on the mistakes made. Because let's talk, we, we give the Lowe's brothers a lot of shit, but these guys are straight studs and they're insanely fast on motorcycles. Uh, you know, the Kawasaki team is incredibly well funded. The Yamaha team is very well funded from the factory, have title sponsor Pata, all that stuff. It really is going to come down to who, in this situation, the one team made a mistake and the other team was in a position to capitalize upon it. It's no different than a fumble. It's no different than an onside kick going horribly wrong. It's no different than an interception. Um, you know, that it's no different than an own goal on accident in, in, in you know, uh, in European style football. I mean, that shit happens and you have to put yourself in an advantage. An own goal only matters if the other team, you know, if you, if you still can't score more than them, you know, that kind I thought, of stuff. I I thought you said own goal as in you score on yourself. 
That's what I am saying. What did you think I was saying? Oh, you do you do score on yourself? That can happen about? in soccer. What are you talking about? If oh. you accidentally own goal, that that's a thing. What are you talking about? No, I just. What just I mean is, it's here. a mistake that causes a yeah. score that puts you in a position to win or to lose. And you know, that's the that's the mark. You look in UFC, and you look in fights, guys who make mistakes. <laughs> their camp went a little wrong. Their weight cut went a little wrong, or maybe they came out with a slightly altered game plan. I mean, Luke Rockhold got knocked out by Michael Bisbing, and Luke Rockhold beats Michael Bisbing nine times out of ten. But the one time it mattered, he took advantage of a mistake. You know no what I mean? And knocked him out. About. I'm, but there's lots to do because I get a surprisingly lot of people who comment on my like fighting references. All awesome. I'm saying is that I I don't really consider this an outlier situation like say a weird rain race where no one wants to take a risk. This was simply Alex Lowe's taking advantage of the situation that was handed him and winning cleanly. Yeah, and I mean, and the fact that Vandermark was also on the podium right behind him and right. challenged him slightly for the win just gives more justification to the fact that Yamaha has really brought their bike forward. I mean, the last two, tra- like Donington and Bruno, n- not all the World Series bike tracks are like that. We're going to see many other different riding styles winning. Um, Johnny Ray, I'm sure, will will win quite a few more races. Hopefully, Ducati figures their shit out. But Yamaha seems to have kind of figured out, like, edge grip and, holding pa- and carrying pace through corners. And it's, right. it's now a strength of their R1. They don't have the stop and go that uh, that Kawasaki has, and they don't really have the driving off the edge of the tire that uh, that Ducati has. But these are those are three different riding styles, and it hopefully will continue to make the series better to see them. Right, and uh, we've talked when... about we've talked about how mentally the ability to win alone is worth positions for riders, right? Like speed worth tenths. Oh, like when yeah. you're in the dogfight, right? When you're in the dogfight for the podium, your pace is a hell of a lot different than in the dogfight for seventh. And this goes to not just the riders, but teams as well. You're telling me right now that Yamaha, the Pata Yamaha, is not working. Top to bottom, left to right, from the fucking dude who throws out the fucking trash to the guy who changes the calipers to the software engineer and all that are not working extra hard now knowing that their combined effort might legitimately mean wins. It's a whole different ball three, game than three of them. Right. It's a whole different ball game now for that team day in and day out on race weekends, knowing that if they work as a well oiled machine, they have a hell of a good chance at a victory. Um and I think that means a lot for the team in general, which of course translates to the writers. Once you have that taste of victory and then you back it up with more wins to prove that it's not an outlier, that it's real, it wasn't a fluke, now you have a team that's working their asses off. That's a team that burns the midnight oil. That's a team that when Vandermark or Lowe's chucks it down the road in practice, they don't roll their eyes and go, ah, oh, fuck. They, right? Like, we got to put this back together. They they bust ass. They burn the midnight oil. They're up till 2 in the morning on Saturday night because they know on Sunday that the difference of that one mistake could mean the victory, and I think that's going to go huge. They have really broken through that ceiling, and I think this season, you're gonna, this is not the final win for them, for sure. So you don't think this is a Jack Miller situation where that one win is going to ruin Lowe's entirely? Like, nah. I know, I know you're, I know you're going to say no. I just had to bring it up anyway. Right, and I don't think that. Don't... I think that ruined Jack Miller for that team, but not the team, not racing in general. Right, like that is a that uh, is a good point. And I mean, you just said exactly that, right? The a lot of Lowe's is is essentially power in these races and skill or like ability is going to stem from the fact that Yamaha is behind them and Yamaha knows that they can win when your entire team and the rider and everyone knows that they can win. It works out a whole lot better than just the, the egotistical racer being the only one that thinks they're the best. Right. Yeah, literally exactly. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I know you don't like it when we agree, but that's a a fully agree to you on that point. (laughs) Oh man. Um, what's up? What's, what's next with world Superbike? I think that's all we really wanted to cover. Um, I think that, uh, I think that Yamaha winning three races is going to ruin my hopes of a spec ECU for next year, yep. which I'm very, and sad also about. Sabi Flores getting multiple podiums. Yeah, but that was, I mean, he was, mm, I don't know if that one hurt that much because, uh, that that essentially just guaranteed that Ducati was going to keep their current rev limit. The, actually, uh, the FIM and Dorna, instead of decreasing Kawasaki and Ducati's rev limit, they actually gave more RPM to some of the other teams. They gave more RPM to the Beamer, not the Aprilia, to the Honda, to the MB Agusta, 
And then and then what happened? And then Jordi Torres on the NBA Gusta didn't finish both races, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So it's not it's not working out well for them. Um, but yeah, like I'm not gonna. I'll, we'll probably cover it at the end of the season whether or not I think the the regulation change for World Superbike actually worked. Um, and if I still want, if I still want Spec ECU, hint, I I still want Spec ECU. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's uh. <clears throat> I kind of want to talk about one more thing about penalties, but maybe we should save that for later. I want to know where the fuck they came from, but I don't know, Kev. Let's, uh, let's, no, let's I not get into this. I've got a long, distinguished history of racing and watching racing. I've been doing it forever, and I could probably come up with lots of ideas when and how they changed and, and how they went from, you know, 30 second penalties live on track, but you keep it going to, to ride throughs, to penalty points. Uh, Rob is stuck on this penalty kick. It's kind of interesting, but I think that we to, to do more talk on that, we want a little more history and, and uh, kind of an outline of how things changed over time, which isn't hard to go back and look at the rule book and see how things change per rule, you know, per season. It, but, it is actually because they just overwrite the old ones. And unless yes. you save them, they're impossible to fucking find. Ask me how I know. <laughs> right. No, I agree. We'll, um, we're... I want to do another little journalistic experience for you guys on on where penalties came from and what they're doing. Like we already talked a little bit about Supercross and how they handle things. Obviously, we we all remember the penalty system that uh, the penalty point system in MotoGP that was kind of brought up after Simoncelli took out Danny Pedrosa at Le Mans and Danny got hurt. Um, we'll we'll do history later. Uh, let's not do that now. Right now. Let's introduce. This is way more segment. fun. Trust me, way more fun. What can we talk about? We can talk can about we... a bunch of random old penalties, or we can talk about the ability for you as fans to call us and leave us voicemails and ask us questions and interact and otherwise be a part of the show itself. So, um, I'm going to go with, let's see, let's talk about Rob's obscure rule <laughs> history. Or let's get fans on the show saying crazy shit, doing what they do, and being a part of it. I'm going to go with fans saying crazy shit for 400, Alex. All right. So we're going to do we're gonna do the serious one first. The and answer then we'll to that do... question is, what is the BrotoGP hotline? What is the BrotoGP hotline? Um, BrotoGP hotline is a phone number that you can call and you can leave us voicemails. You can send us text messages and you can send us picture messages. No dick pics. Um, however, this is a podcast first. So audio is much more helpful. If you want to think have a about question like, think, think show, like 1992 shock jock Howard Stern, your local radio, like ability to call in and be a part of the show. That's the best way to put it. That's the way we think about it. Um, you know, we post on our social media, like, you know, we have an episode coming up. What do you want us to talk about? And people will say their questions or their statements or their craziness or post their memes and all that fun stuff or all their gifts. It's great. This is just continuing to bring you guys in and be a part of the show and increase the community and the sort of the connectivity of all of us. So you can feel free to call should you go. Um, all right. Serious question first. Here we go. So my question is, do we see any of the current Moto America riders, and that be Super Sport or any of the other uh, classes, jump to Moto2, Moto3, or Moto GP in the coming years, or are they doomed to forever ride in Moto America, or maybe like Josh Heron with the World Superbike? All right, so our listener wants to know, is uh and uh please give us your name so we can thank you personally feel free to i don't know tell us your handle give us your name do whatever but either way they want to know if anyone in moto america is going to make the jump to inter international paddock specifically moto gp but maybe even uh or moto 3 moto 2 gp or maybe even world Bike. Mm -hmm. kev what do you think i actually Any, hope so <laughs> really i hope not because we want to the last thing we want to do is build some kind of large talent and then instantly get rid of them 
we want to build <laughs> multiple names first, right? Like, um, you know, Ben Bostrom didn't get to go to World Superbike, and Nikki Hayden didn't get to moto- go to MotoGP because they uh, were the only name in the paddock and then left right away. They went because they were able to beat your Matt Maladins or Duhamels. They were able to win against a well, – it was at the time considered to be a very – um talent rich you know pool so i don't i'm actually not thinking we need americans jumping to the series now the long game for me like i don't want to see another joe roberts go and like get 16th or 15th or 14th and have a bunch of idiots on facebook being like why didn't you talk about that i don't know because he scored one point who fucking cares he's writing for the nts team that doesn't doesn't do shit like i want to see writers I want to see the talent pool be deep enough that when someone moves over, they move over to a solid team. I want to see, you know, uh, some someone, not even name right now, move on to the Yamaha factory squad like Spees did after he dominated and beat, you know, Maladin and he beat Jake Zemke and those kind of guys when the talent pool was rich, when Eric Bostrom, when Neil Hogston came over and was unable to fight against, uh, you know, those Yoshimura Suzuki's, that proved that Ben Spees was someone, but that was because the talent pool was rich. We had James Ellison riding the Corona Honda in AMA. For me, I don't want to see anyone go right now. I want to see the field get deeper first. Yeah, and and to your point, don't don't I think do that's... it. Go don't ahead. do it like DC, man. You can't have Justice League right away. You got to build your shit. You got to have Iron <laughs> Man. Then you got to have Thor. Then Incredible Hulk. You got to build up to it. Don't try to fucking rush your stuff. Otherwise, you're gonna bust your nut early, and you're gonna be like, you know, Jake Gagne or Ganji. How the fuck you say his name? I don't even care. All that Honda running around getting tenth that no one cares. Yeah, I mean, and that that was uh, one of the better rides available in World Superbike, but that just right. shows us the lack of uh, or the, the lack of parity between the team expertise over there. Yeah, right. I mean, and and to your point, that's exactly why it's not going to happen anytime soon because people that are signing these contracts, people that are that are looking for riders, they know that the talent pool isn't big enough. It's not there to produce a, a really great talent. I mean. One of the reasons why America does so fucking good in the Olympics every year is because we have so many people doing these sports that the ones that are winning are literally some of the best in the world. Right. And the other thing that I want to see is, you know, I go back to that Ben Bostrom comment, right, or Nick or, or Nikki Hayden is. The, the heyday of when American riders would enter Laguna Seca World Superbike, boom, Nikki Hayden, would enter World Superbike, uh, you know, wild card and win a race. You know, yeah. or podium, or do really well, or Eric Bostrom Speaking. would hold yeah. on. Eric Bostrom would do really well in AMA, and then go over to World Superbike and ride that Kawasaki for three or four rounds and fucking perform. I would rather see not, um, and I'll get to the point. I know you were bringing up Rob. I would rather see a Josh Heron on the attack R1 wild card in Laguna and hopefully doing really well. And then, right, exactly. And then I'm hoping that maybe they. You know, instead of Nicholas Kanepa running, uh, you know, the third Yamaha R1, I would like to see Cam Bobier on a third factory Yamaha R1, you know, for two rounds, that kind of stuff. That's what I want to see. Not full-time riders leaving America, but the top riders getting a chance to shine and shining in wildcard well, we appearances. Yeah, we got to test the waters, right? Josh Heron is going to wildcard at Laguna Seca on his R- attack performance r1 um he's actually gonna do double duty he's gonna race in all four races both Brutal. both superbike races on saturday both superbike races on sunday it's gonna i don't understand how it's possible that he can do this i mean but I, yeah i phys- i don't understand how it's physically possible it's fucking insane so if you go back to our josh hair interview that we did <laughs> Uh, we're hoping to get him on again. We've had some logistics problem connecting the two and all that stuff. But uh, you know, the dude wants one of our shirts that we're releasing. So you know, we we talk. Yeah, we're gonna like we're gonna trade him a shirt for an interview. With yeah. Josh Heron. <laughs> Josh Heron told us in a very candid and uh, an open and honest interview that he that he worried that his 
very bad showing for a variety of reasons, not just him, the team, but you know, he did take personal onus and responsibility in Moto 2 might be why Cam Bobier doesn't go international. He literally name dropped and said, like, I feel bad about that. Go back and listen to that episode. He is candid, honest, and open. So if you want to talk about a storyline right now about why this is dope, is the guy who in certain aspects may be partially responsible for the image issue that America has. I'm not saying it's his fault, but that does happen. You know, perception is reality. Now has the chance to, in such a fucking awesome way, right that potential wrong. If he goes out and busts ass and performs and does well and has a good showing in AMA, or excuse me, in Laguna World Superbike, like, you, that that's like these podiums he's getting these potential wins that's the phoenix from the ashes but that mm. is that is fucking josh heron getting the infinity stone and snapping his finger and bringing half the world back to life <laughs> bring half of america back to life that's the fucking red white and blue gauntlet son and every one of these jewels are giant hunks of american coal Freedom burning coal, son, from the Appalachian Mountains, snapping his finger and resurrecting half of American racing and bringing us back to the promised land. Yeah, it's a rocket and, red player. And if and when Josh Heron does good at at World Superbike at Laguna Seca, in order to be considered for a ride in an international paddock in one of the higher classes, you have to beat Josh Heron. Right. Right. Like we we talked about Garrett Gerloff earlier this season expecting him to do great things in the superbike class because of how dominant he was in super sport and because we thought that jd beach was pushing him hard to those titles gerloff isn't there yet he can't beat josh heron even though he's on a factory bike with amazing support with the factory team so off the top of my fucking head yeah. i just gave moto america the greatest like seven minute video they make on youtube to pump this race <laughs> just put us on the broadcast squad son <laughs> oh man uh, are there any other riders that we could see going over i mean it would be it would probably be beneficial for for american riders to just skip the american series entirely go over to spain do cev moto 3 compete there move into gp moto 3 and then move up that way if you're on a 600 over here and then you try and jump over to moto 2 or even jump down to moto 3 for some reason maybe because you're still 17 years old um it, it might be kind of like a jason uribe joe roberts sort of career where you you you're you're going over too soon right our 600 class so far, it's mostly like in this last race, it's now three people up front. And then the best of the rest is is almost a full second behind. Um, it's the, the, the talent level isn't there. I mean, really, the Superbike class is kind of similar, right? This last round, we really had the podium battle out front and then everyone else was further back. It's it, it happens in most series, but we need more talent in order to be able to successfully push someone into the international series. And and I really like. And just we like need a earlier. way to gauge that talent, which is yeah. more Americans wild carding. Yeah, and and then Cameron Bobier right did uh he he wrote it it was Donington Park right on the mm -hmm. World Series bike R one team, uh the factory Yamaha team and uh what crashed in the first race and had top ten in the second right that's but, not yeah, enough rain, of a rain, showing yeah rain dogged weekends not the best you know way to, to to do it you know circumstances didn't work out too well it's kind of like when ben spees rode uh the suzuki for moto gp at donnington it's just a bad place to wild card yeah yeah right it's gonna yeah. rain every single time yeah. um yeah, so so that's our first question. We went really long on this one because uh, there were actually no other questions in our voicemail box about Moto America. So uh, we're going to try and keep things on topic. We got plenty about Marquez. We had plenty of jokes. Um, there was actually, there were quite a few about Scott Redding uh, and Simon Crafar. So we'll get to those when we uh, next next week when we record after the uh, the Catalan GP round. But I do have one one closing voicemail here for you, Kev. Can right, you, can you, I think, uh, can you, ex I want to know how Rob got so sexy and how his cheekbones are mm. so like perfectly shaped. You contour Rob, 
you take the makeups and you contour and you make it look. I, just, I swear to God, your face is perfect. How are you so sexy all the time? That's what the listeners really want to know. How Rob's so sexy all the time. Definitely not Kevin leaving this message. I don't fucking people named Kevin are dumb. Definitely not gay either. Or maybe they are gay. I don't know. Damn you, hot Rob. <laughs> Kev, Kev, was that Kev? Was that you? Nah, it wasn't me at all. I don't know who that was. Are you, are guy you sounded sure? hell. Guy sounded handsome as fuck though. <laughs> it sounded like there were two bottles of wine in, in his very recent past. In, yes, uh, in attempting to <laughs> attempting to test the listener line, I did drunk dial and profess my undying love for Rob. That is a thing that happened. <laughs> oh man. All right. I'm not saying that listeners, when we give the number out, that you should drunk dial us, but you should drunk dial us. Yes, you could probably drunk dial us. There will also be a probably a long running uh, a bit on our social media of terrible Google Voice transcripts because Correct. Google Voice does a really really bad job terrible of job. understanding what the hell you're saying. It right. didn't even get Scott Redding. Especially, like, yeah, especially in a sport where we're using a lot of, uh, you know, um, different language uh, terms, people's names, all of that. It's just, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's great. That being said, <clears throat> all you assholes are probably wondering what the number is. So let me, um, why don't you grab your pen and paper really quick and I will uh, spell it out to you so we don't get 10,000 fucking voicemails tomorrow. Hopefully some of you can decipher this code, which is, <clears throat> here we go. Uh, Petrucci, Yanone, Rozzy, Rozzy, Dovi, Hayden. Let me repeat. All right, that. everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Petru- go ahead. I'll let, repeat it one more time, Kev. Petrucci, Yanone, Rossi, Rossi, Dovi, Hayden. If you're an international caller, um, I think Google Voice will charge you for calling us. Uh, don't forget to dial the one for the country code. Is that a thing? I don't know how to make international phone calls, but it should work. So try zero, it out. Zero, one. Zero, zero, one. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, if I think the, the biggest charge they have per minute is like from Antarctica and it's six bucks a minute or something. So don't call unless you want to spend six bucks and you're in, if Antarctica. you're on our social media, I'm peppering that number in actual numerical form pretty regularly bouncing around in the stories. Hold, so look in our, hold stories. on. Oh really? Oh, don't do it on social media. Do it on what? do it on the army. Do it on the, the army. Is, the army is social media too. There have to be. That's it, it's through Facebook, bro. All right. If you want the actual number, go join the Facebook army, which is a or the Broda GP army, which is a Facebook group, and you will find the actual number there. But I think you can get the code. Figure it out. All Follow right, everyone. Me on Instagram and just ask me. <laughs> that would work too. All yeah. right, everyone. Uh, we're, uh, we're going to round this one out right now. Thanks for listening. Uh, it is Tuesday right now, but you will catch us in a week with the Catalan MotoGP round. And, uh, we'll have, we'll have Dennis or Everett back for that one for a good three way one more time. And, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Like, share, and subscribe this video. Tell all your friends, leave us some comments. Tell us what we missed. Interact. And we're having fun with it. Peace. A good three-way one more time, title of Rob Sextape. <laughs>